Have you heard of Yara? Borrowing from Wikipedia's description, because I can't seem to write a better one myself, the tool provides a rule-based approach to create descriptions of malware families based on textual or binary patterns. In fact, maybe you've seen indicators of compromise, or IOCs, distributed as Yara files. Here's an example of what one might look like. Using a simple command, we can direct the tool to use that set of logic to search for those strings and sets of conditions across any arbitrary data. So imagine you suspect a particular piece of malware has infected a system, and you want to quickly look for those IOCs to verify your suspicions. How would you accomplish that? Would you recursively grep every file on disk looking for a particular string, assuming you even had access to grep to begin with? And if so, what if the string was represented in hex or binary? What then? Or what if you needed to do this on a large number of endpoints running a variety of operating systems, including Windows, Mac OS, and Linux? Well, that's exactly where Yara can help. Yara can run against everything from a single file to terabytes of files. In fact, you can leverage the power of Yara alongside volatility to analyze a memory image. That's right, Yara can actually be utilized via a volatility plugin to automatically identify specific patterns and conditions in the memory image that could help facilitate malware identification. How awesome is that? As an example, remember the recent episode within the Introduction to Memory Forensic series in which we analyzed a system infected with a Cutwell Trojan? Well, rule sets are widely available for that malware family, and we could use Volatility's built-in Yara Scan plugin, as seen here, to search for that malware. So in the next section, we'll actually see Yara in action, both for on-disk artifacts, as well as for memory forensics using this plugin. So sit back, relax, and by the end of this episode, I guarantee you, you'll be ready to leverage this awesome pattern matching tool in your environment. So let's check it out. All right, the first thing we need to understand is the basic anatomy of a Yara rule. Let's start by taking a look at three examples that don't do much. You're looking at the first of these now. Pause the video for a second and see if you can understand the syntax before we discuss it. Ready? So this is pretty basic. You'll notice the rule is defined by the rule keyword at the top, followed by an identifier that can contain any alphanumeric character and the underscore character, but the first character cannot be a digit. In this case, it's example one with a capital E. And then we have an open brace as we would have at the beginning of a C function, and you'll notice the corresponding close brace at the bottom defining the end of the rule. In fact, much of the Yara syntax follows the same lexical conventions as C, you can even include C-style comments, both single-line and multi-line, in your Yara rules. The first section is entitled Meta, and as you might guess, this is arbitrary metadata. We can put anything here, but most commonly you'll find a description, an author name, and a date. This section is optional and not required for a functional Yara rule. The second section is entitled Strings, and as you can see, we've defined three strings named Domain1, Domain2, and domain three, each specifying a value of a particular domain name that we might want to flag for an IOC. The third section is entitled condition, and as you would expect, this defines the conditions upon which the rule will trigger. In this case, a match of any of the three domain names defined above will satisfy the condition. Pretty easy, right? Just about every rule you look at is going to be structured in a similar way. Next, let's take a look at a slight variation of this example. Here we see a rule named example two. So how is this different than the first? Well, for starters, we've added the no case modifier. A modifier is that text that you see at the end there. In fact, we'll look at a couple of other modifiers shortly. This means that any case variation of badsite1.com, badsite2.com, or badsite3.com will match whereas the previous rule would only match the literal string, which was lowercase. This is a pretty common modifier. And then under condition, notice that we have two of. 
followed by three domain strings specified in paren. This means that any two must match before the rule is triggered. For example, bad site one and bad site two, bad site one and bad site three, and so on. Of course, this number could be anything you like, and this kind of logic is also frequently used when defining conditions. Next, let's look at our third example, once again building on the same logic. We've added an IP string. That garbled regex at the end should look pretty familiar to you. It's a regular expression that in this case matches the format of an IPv4 address. Granted, this would match what I like to call CSI cyber IP addresses like 325.281.56.1, but you get the idea. Notice the wide and ASCII modifiers at the end. The wide modifier can be used to search for strings encoded with two bytes per character. The ASCII modifier can be used by itself, but it's unnecessary as a string is already assumed to be ASCII unless otherwise specified. However, with wide, we'll need to specify it because we want to search for ASCII-only strings with two bytes per character. Under condition, we still have our two of, but notice that at the end of the line, we have an and specifying an additional condition. On the next line, we specify that the IP string must match. So in other words, our IP address regex must be present and must have a match. This is followed by another and, and then we have file size less than one KB, which means that the file size must be less than one kilobyte. Again, very easy to read, right? I'm willing to bet that had I not explained any of that to you, you could have read it and told me exactly what was happening, especially if you have any coding experience. Now let's look at something more real world. This is a real Yara rule that one might actually use. It searches for packed executables, in this case, specifically those packed with UPX, which is one of the most common packers available. Click the card above to watch the Sum Assembly Required episode within the Introduction to Malware Analysis series if you'd like to learn more about this. For our strings, we're defining MZ to match the MZ header in a PE32 executable. And following that, we have two UPX strings in hexadecimal matching UPX0 and UPX1. UPX compresses sections stored within the section table of a PE file, and the renaming of header names to these values is a strong indication of UPX usage, which is why we're searching for this. Lastly, we have another string that defines the capital UPX exclamation point. Note that none of these have no case specified at the end, so the uppercase string must match. For our conditions, we're looking for the MZ header at the beginning of the file, byte zero, and UPX zero and UPX one within the first 1024 bytes, and the UPX signature within the first 1024 bytes. So all of those conditions must be true to match this rule. Makes sense, right? We're going to see this live in the next section of the video because this is one of the rules we'll actually be using. Next, let's take a look at our most complex rule. This matches one variant of the WannaCry ransomware. I'm not going to bore you by reading every line here, but you'll notice multiple strings defined along with a new modifier we haven't seen before called full word. This ensures that the string will match only if it appears in the file delimited by non-alphanumeric characters. To borrow an example from the official Yara documentation, the string domain if defined as full word, would not match www.mydomain.com, but it would match www.my-domain.com and www.domain.com, because in both of those cases, the string is surrounded by those non-alphanumeric characters. We'll also look at this signature or rule in the next section. Of course, you should read the official documentation as this is just the tip of the iceberg as far as what's possible with Yara. But now you're at least familiar with the basics and at this point, you know enough to begin writing your own Yara rules that you can leverage in your environment. Keep in mind that while we'll be using the rules with the Yara tool itself, as well as with a volatility plugin, there are many products that also support Yara rule files, including products from Alien Vault, CrowdStrike, FireEye, and Tanium, just to name a few. All right, so enough theory, let's jump over to our SIFT workstation and take a look at this in action. 
You'll notice that I have a couple of directories here, one of which is called binaries, which contains some files that we'll be using for our demo, and one called rules, which contains those same five Yara rules that we looked at in the previous section. We're actually going to be using the bottom two in the demo. Those would be upx underscore pact.yara and wannacry.yara. Before we do anything though, let's go ahead and run Yara with the dash H flag to take a look at our available options. And as you can see, there are quite a few, but we're going to focus only on two. The first of which is dash S, which will print matching strings. Without this, if a Yara rule matches, you'll simply get the rule identifier returned and that's it. But if we use this option, we'll actually see the specific strings within the Yara rule that match. So this can provide some added context and is quite useful. And then we have the dash R option for recursively searching directories or a mount point or something like that so that we can run Yara in bulk against multiple files. We won't be doing this in the demo, but I want you to know that it exists and that it's quite commonly used. Let's go ahead and run Yara, specifying our UPX rule, and we'll run it against our sample GUI binary. And notice that we got back nothing, a blank line. No errors, no output, no nothing. Well, that's because nothing matched, because this is not UPX packed. So let's fix that. Let's go ahead and pack this with UPX, and we'll just call it sample underscore GUI underscore packed and you'll notice that we have one packed file at this point. So now let's change up one directory and try again. And hopefully this time we'll actually get a match because we know it is packed with UPX. So let's go ahead and change this to sample GUI packed. And sure enough, we get UPX underscore packed, which is the rule identifier that matched within that Yara rule file. But that doesn't provide us a lot of additional information. So let's go ahead and tack on that dash s option and now we see the four strings that matched which if you remember from the previous section those are indeed all required for a conditional match and there they are the mz header the two upx sections and the upx signature just exactly like we expected when we reviewed the rule file so now let's go ahead and take a look at our second yara rule which is going to be for wannacry and I just happen to have a WannaCry binary here. So once again, we'll run Yara, specifying the rule, and then the WannaCry.exe binary. And there you go, WannaCry underscore ransomware is the rule identifier that matched. So let's go ahead and tack on that dash S option, and we'll see the specific strings that match. And we can highlight them here, but there are quite a few, as you can see, all of which are indicative of WannaCry. And if we went back and looked at that rule file, we would see the specific conditions that needed to be met to have this rule match. So that's pretty much it for the basic usage of Yara. Again, we specify Yara, followed by the Yara rule file that we want to use, followed by files that we want Yara to process. Again, we can use the dash R option to recursively search through an entire directory or mount point or we can leave that off and just specify a single file as we have here. We also use the dash S option to show the matching strings because without that, we didn't get a whole lot of information, just the fact that it matched. So as you can see, Yara is quite easy to use and it's an extremely powerful tool. Coming up in our final section of this episode, let's take a look at how we can leverage a Yara rule in conjunction with volatility for memory forensics. I think you'll be surprised at just how easy it is. Oh good, you're still here. Congratulations because you made it to the last section of the video. So let's talk about what you're looking at on screen. This is cutwill.yara, which you have not seen before, at least not in this episode. You'll notice this is a little different because we have multiple rule statements. But there are no surprises here, it works just like you would expect. Each rule statement has its own unique identifier, starting with cutwhale underscore 2016, and each of these rule statements contains its own set of strings and conditions that must be met. So we're going to be using this cutwhale.yara file in conjunction with the built-in Yara scan plugin that comes with a standard volatility package. So this is not a third-party plugin that you need to go download from a GitHub repo or anything like that. It's just built-in to the standard package. Let's go ahead and fire up the command prompt 
and then launch volatility and see how we can use this plugin. So for our memory image, this is going to be the infected.raw file. We happen to be using Windows 10 x64 build 17763. We're going to specify the Yara scan plugin and then we're going to use a dash lowercase y followed by the Yara rule file that we wish to use. We could also use a dash uppercase y and specify a string in line on this command line that we want volatility to search for as opposed to the rule file. I just wanted you to know that that is an option. And that's pretty much it. Now this ended up taking several minutes to run, but in the interest of time and keeping your attention, I decided to go ahead and fast forward through this section, and here are the results. You'll notice that we have a single rule that is matched multiple times. That rule is cut will underscore 2016 underscore three. And if you remember the memory forensics baselines episode within the introduction to memory forensics series, it turns out that PID 8988 was indeed one of those three evil PIDs that we immediately identified as a result of our memory analysis. And that's pretty cool because we immediately see that same PID being found with the Cutwell Yara rule. And of course, you can see the hex and ASCII representations of each of those matches off to the right. You see things referring to SVC host.exe, one of which we found in this image to be not legit. And you see other things, including what looks like a Mozilla user agent string. And if we scroll down, you'll notice numerous other matches as well. All of them are again the cutwill underscore 2016 underscore 3 rule, as well as the same PID 8988. And that's pretty much it. That's how easy it is to use Yara scan in conjunction with a Yara rule file. So both the Yara tool itself and Yara Scan, I would say, are equally easy to use. That wraps up this episode. If you've made it to the end, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet subscribed to 13 Cubed and you're enjoying these videos and this content, please do so because it really does help me out and I would greatly appreciate it. Also check out the Patreon page for 13 Cubed for some additional perks and early access to new material. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next episode.